Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Is this working? Yeah, it's working, mashallah. Very good. Um, very happy to be here, first and foremost. I'm very happy to see all those lovely faces, all those. It's a very diverse hall. Um, Amsterdam has a lot of Muslims in it and from different places of the world. So I'm very happy to be uh, in your beautiful country, in your beautiful city. Very clean, by the way. You know, um, yes, it's a very clean city. We're just kind of observing things and good infrastructure. Lots of things to talk about. But to delve right into the topic, um, now I used to work as a teacher, right? And this is how we used to start every lesson with high school kids. We used to have objectives. So I haven't kind of lost that touch, still got that a little bit. These are the objectives of today, right? I've got a laser here. So the first objective is to know the first principles, basic history of liberalism. Number two is to compare Islamic traditionalism, and obviously these are all key words, right? Um, and liberal contractarianism in particular. I'll tell you what that means as well. And number three is to be able to make a judgment based on those comparisons. Now, obviously here, when we're doing a comparative study, we're talking about two things fundamentally. We're talking about similarities and differences. So when we talk about liberalism and Islam or Islamic traditionalism, which we'll come to define, um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at not just points of conflict and tension, but we are going to also be looking at points of overlap. And I think that's the healthy approach. Some people, like the brother mentioned, mashallah, very, uh, very well. I, I really applaud his approach on this one. Um, some people have this conversation in a different kind of way, in an ap apologetic kind of way. You know, and that is because, as he's mentioned, we're minority groups in this country. So we're asked lots of questions all the time. We're asked about things that relate to human rights, right? And human rights have become a buzzword, right? Very important, you know, after 1948, as we'll come to know, the convention, the, Euro, the, the human, convention, uh, human rights convention, 1948, with the 30 articles, have become almost like scripture. So questions like, you know, your religion is against human rights for X, Y, Z reason. And this kind of trajectory that we're introduced to, which assumes that we have to go from the primitive kind of state that we're in right now and follow through the European um, kind of progress trajectory that the Christians have already done. And we need to now follow the same kind of, you know, the same kind of course. And of course, there are a lot of presuppositions and assumptions with this, which we are going to discover. But the first thing we need to kind of talk about is what is referred to as the epistemological basis okay, of, of, of liberalism. Now, it's a big word. What does this mean? Epistemology is how you get to know, making sense of the world. Making sense of making sense of the world. Basically, how do you know about the world, right? When we're talking about the epistemological basis of liberalism, in particular, we're talking about what grounds liberalism? What are the assumptions of liberalism? What are the first principles of liberalism? Now, what are first principles generally? You can break something down, like for example, this thing here, or a mobile phone, you can break it down to smaller constituent parts, okay? Everything is broken down to basic parts. Those are the first principles of the thing. So when we're talking about the first principles, we're asking, if we break liberalism down to the lowest common multiple, if you like, to its kind of basic building blocks, what are we left with? What, are, what is the foundation by which liberalism is built on? You can't build you know, castles on thin air, can you? Right? I mean, I'm sure you guys know in Amsterdam, you've got great infrastructure. You've got uh, incredible engineers here, right? So it's about foundation. What are the foundations you know, of liberalism? And so to know that, you have to look at the basic philosophy of liberalism. And if you look at that, you'll find that there are some themes which are consistent. And what are the themes that are consistent? Basically, if you look at the works of all the way from John Locke, who is, you could argue, the founding father of liberalism, a man called John Locke. You could say he's the founding father of liberalism, all the way down to John Rawls, who was probably the last major contributor of liberalism. You'll find that they believed in something called the hedonistic principle. Now, the hedonistic principle is simple, right? It's about pain and pleasure. It's as simple as that. They argued that morality should be premised, predicated, aligned with pain, the human 
propensity to pain and pleasure. And the idea was, you should maximize as much pleasure as you can, and you should minimize as much pain as possible. This is the, you know, the most desirable and moral way to live. This evolved, as we'll find out, into something called utilitarianism, which is the, literally the greatest good for the greatest number. The greatest good for the greatest number. So eventually this, main, this meant that we are trying to maximize pleasure for as many people as possible, and we are trying to also, by extension, minimize pain for as many people as possible. That's the, the model. That's point one. N number two is, you'll be quite surprised, is theology. Now, if you look at the work of, for example, John Locke, you'll find that he oftentimes makes reference to God. He says, we are created equal, right? And remember, when he was writing his major book called The Two Treatises of Government, he was write it, writing it to someone called Robert Filmer. And he was arguing using the Bible. So a lot of the things here, and this is an important point, and I want everyone to remember this, right? A lot of the assumptions of liberalism depend upon a theological backing. In other words, the fact that we were created equal. Listen to the terminology here. You're created equal. That's taken from John Locke. It was put into the Declaration of Independence. It was put into the constitutions of major countries like America and France. But it's taken from John Locke. He was a theist. He believed in God. Now, the question is, now, obviously, in Europe, especially Western Europe, there's a rise in atheism. But you still find that atheist politicians use the same kind of terminology. We are equal. We're born equal. Now, the question is, well, John Locke had God to premise that on. He had God to predicate that on. He had the Bible to go back on. But what do you have now as an atheist? How can you prove as an atheist, right, on naturalism, say, or something else, that you are born equal? In fact, on naturalism, we're not born equal. In fact, on naturalism, we're fundamentally unequal. Why? Because you've got someone like me, who's about six foot six... <laughs> Yes. And someone else who might be much shorter. <laughs> you have black people and white people. You have people who are born in different ge geographic places and have different kind of opportunities as a result. People who are born disabled. People who are born conjoined to a twin. People who are born in this way and that. Naturalistically, where is the equality here? In fact, one thing we can guarantee is inequality. Even with twins, you have different fingerprints. Everything on naturalism is unequal. For an atheist then to say, look, we're, we're born equal, on what basis? Because actually John Locke was arguing using God before. So what are you arguing, base, basing, uh, what are you basing this on? So, uh, you know, a straightforward question to an atheist liberal, how can you prove that we're born equal? How are you going to do that? In fact, evolution the theory of Darwinian evolution would tell us, and not just Darwinian evolution, any other kind of outgrowth of evolution, would tell us that actually we're not born equal. In fact, it's survival of the fittest, that we, are, we have no tendency to equality at all. In fact, we have a tendency to survival and reproduction. So on what basis are we born equal? You see, this discussion which has now permeated the mass media and infiltrated almost every academic circle in the West, is predicated on something which has been dumped away in the dustbin of history, which is religion, for the most part. I mean, obviously, there are lots of Christian liberals who can justify this, or Jewish liberals who can say, well, actually, we still believe in equality. But then we go to the Bible and see what kind of equality does the Bible talk about? Seriously, that's what we're going to have to do now. How does the Bible define equality? That's the discussion now. And that was the discussion, by the way, that Robert Filmer and John Locke were having in the beginning. They were both making references to the story of Genesis and the, to the Bible and all these things. So what equality do you mean exactly? And that's important. Now, we, we talked about John Rawls. This was a guy who was... You know, he's a very influential individual. And he came, he's one of the, he's probably one of the individuals who 
people do their PhDs on now. He's one of the only individuals people still do their PhDs on in, in the liberal thought. He's probably the last one they do that on. He's like, in, in terms of contribution, his contribution was quite big, and he's probably the biggest you know, philosopher in the 20th century in, in Europe. And he, he argued for equality on a different kind of basis. We'll talk about how he argued for equality. But this is my claim, and I'll come back to it, and I want you to remember it. All liberal thinkers who argue on the basis of equality as a first principle either do so, number one, religiously, as we've seen with John Locke, or number two, with reference, and I'm going to use my terms blatantly here, with reference to a type of mythology. And you're going to say, well, what are you talking about? How can you substantiate that? Yes, there is such a thing as liberal myth. And we're going to uncover and unearth today what we mean by liberal myth. Because usually when, sorry to say, the white man, or let's say the westerner, when they use the word myth in circles, or if you look at vernacularly in the dictionary, what do you, let's be honest, what do you have in your mind when I say myth? You have some Hindu god in your mind. You have Greek gods in your mind. That's what you have. In your mind. Let's be honest, right? You might even have Genesis in your mind. You might even have Quranic images in your mind. Why? Because that is the Orientalist understanding of what a myth is. It's a story of some sorts, which is not substantiated in real history, isn't it? So to what extent is liberalism based on a story which is predicated on a real history? That's an important discussion. We'll come to it. So... Individualism is another kind of thing which liberalism, I mean, not all of liberalism, but a, a large part of it kind of promotes. And this individualism is this, the idea that human beings know what's best for them, okay? So individualism, it literally comes from individual, right? That the individual knows what's best for them. If you abstract the individual, you take them out of their social circles and their community and their country and so on, that individual by themselves is better off knowing what's best for them. And obviously, uh, even now, to be honest, to be fair, there's a new debate that's circling, which is individualism versus communitarianism. Now, communitarianism, you have people like Michael Sandel, who's right now one of the biggest scholars in probably the Western world, talking about liberalism. And he talks about communitarianism. He says, no... He says, human beings are not individual in that way. We're all interdependent. Communities um, are actually more effective than individuals in terms of social organization. So there's a big discussion now between individualism and communitarianism. It's a new debate. All right, so in terms of history, to get straight into the thick of it, the question is, when did liberalism kind of begin? So... You could say liberalism began out of England. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm a British guy and I'm trying to enforce my you know, history on you. It came out, you could say, it was around this time, around the 1600s, which is about the 17th century. So the mid-17th century, when you had English Civil War. Now, the English Civil War was a long and drawn-out kind of war. You can look it up. I'm not going into that too much. Otherwise, I will feel like I'm back in um, school. It's, and then, then, then you have something called the Bill of Rights. Now, the thing is now here with the Bill of Rights. The question is, the, question, the all-important question was, to what extent should government's power be limited? And obviously, at this time, you had tensions between the monarchy and parliament. And we wanted to know what parliament, how much power should be given to the sovereign, which in this case is parliament. So John Locke, who died in 1706, actually contributed to this discourse massively. Because when he wrote his book, The Two Treatises of Government, this was incorporated into the Bill of Rights, which is a very important document in English law. This is, which was written in 1689. So a lot of his ideas, his, what would then become liberal ideas about, you know, life, property, uh, you know, uh, uh, these, these important things that you have to be protected, the protectables, right? So, for example, life and property, etc., that would be incorporated into the Bill of Rights. So this was a turning point, you could say, in the history of 
liberalism. Now, John Locke died around 1706, which is the early 18th century. So in terms of liberalism and its development, you could argue that it became known really as a tradition in around the 18th century, which means it's quite a young tradition in the grand scheme of things. It's about 300 years old. So after that, you had the, obviously the US founding fathers and the documents that were associated with the, found, you know, the beginning of the, the, you know, the Republic of the United States. And a lot of John Locke's ideas and, and other people's ideas were incorporated into those documents. So once again, liberalism started to become institutionalized and it became the, it became the slowly is becoming the dominant ethic. Now, don't forget, religion was very important at this time as well. But if you look at the, the rising importance of liberalism, you'll find that it coincided with the decline of enthusiasm about religion. So people were becoming more in, enthusiastic about liberalism, about an ideology which in, in and of itself you, don't, you couldn't argue is Abrahamic, for example, in religious uh, complexion. It was something different, and they were becoming less enthusiastic about. They were becoming less enthusiastic about Christianity. You had someone like Rousseau, who was a very important figure, and sorry, he died in 1778. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list of you know. This is just a suggestive list to show you some key points of history. And we said that the not only did the USA have an important impact, but France as well, because as you guys know, France was founded on these kinds of ideas as well because of the revolution. You had the French Revolution, you had the American Revolution against the British, you had the French Revolution against the, the bourgeoisie, right, the elites, and so on. Uh, a very important philosopher in the history of liberalism is Immanuel Kant. He, you could argue, really, he was one of the most important philosophers, you could make this argument, in Western history. You could make this argument maybe right after Aristotle or something. He's a very important figure, not only in liberal thought, but in all of Western thought, Immanuel Kant. And he gave some contributions as well. As you can see here, this is a time where it's kind of the Industrial Revolution. Things are starting to change here. You know, steam uh, trains were being invented and so on. So he was at a time where there was technological developments and so on. Then you had John Stuart Mill, who was around in the Victorian era. This guy is important in liberalism and generally, because a lot of the dominant ethics that we have today, especially in social circles, are based on his ideas, by the way. And he was way, to use a colonial, you know, post-colonial term, beyond his time, in the sense that he was for universal suffrage for both men and women, which we don't have a problem with as Muslims, by the way, just in case anyone tries to chuck something at me. Right? But he was, you know, and the Prophet Muhammad, by the way, and Islam, they gave, you know, the Muslims gave bay'ah, men and women gave bay'ah 1400 years ago. And that's just an interesting kind of tangential point there. We're in the year, what, 2000, what are we now? 2018 or 19? I forget. <laughs> I'm joking. So, yeah, so this was about 100 years ago that women could both, men and women can vote, right? hundred years ago, uh, that's when, you know, in, in, in the UK at least, in, in, um, in Canada it was 1917. But he was beyond his time in that perspective. He wrote a treatise on, uh, on women and women's um, kind of uh, universal suffrage and other kind of things. The most important thing that you could probably pluck out of his philosophy, which is very important, is the harm principle. And you'll find that this is... The logic that almost everyone uses, you know, to justify whatever moral they want to justify. And the harm principle, going back to our hedonistic principle now. The hedonistic principle was what? That you, you, want, to, you want to minimize pain and maximize what? Pleasure. Okay, so you, everyone's with me, yeah? So obviously, so this guy called Jeremy Bentham came along and said, but hold on. He said, yeah, we want to maximize the amount, as much pe uh, pleasure as possible, and as, as possible, generally. Yeah? So you had scenarios like you know, a gang rape scenario. So if you have 10 men and one woman, and they all want to enjoy themselves, so they can all yeah, exploit the woman. This was the issue with utilitarianism. So John Stuart Mill came along and said, there's a problem with utilitarianism. 
which is that it allows this kind of infringement of human rights. Or he didn't really refer to it as human rights, as we'll come to know, but on individual liberties. And so you can do whatever you want to do, so long as you don't harm anyone else. This is the harm principle. Let's say it one more time. You can do whatever you want to do, so long as you don't harm anyone else. So now, if you ask, it's a bit of a controversial topic, but if you ask why is homosexuality, why should it be, or any kind of thing, right? Not just homosexuality, any non-normative sexual practice. Any non-normative sexual practice. Should it be allowed? So a liberal would, should answer, at least. So long as it doesn't harm anyone else, it should be allowed. Have you heard this? So obviously, those religious people who were arguing against, for example, homosexuality, were saying that it's not natural and all those kind of things, yeah? A liberal turns around and says, that's not the ethic that we're dealing with right now. The ethic that we're dealing with is that so long as it doesn't harm anyone else, you can't get involved. That's the ethic. Okay, if that's the ethic, my question would be, what about incest rights? That's my question, because it's not really something which is emphasized. Now, someone might argue that, hold on, deformed babies, you can have deformed baby coming out of that situation. I would say, hold on, what if a, a father and a son, there's no baby going to come out of that, actually, or a brother and a brother. That's not something which liberals have actually, in my estimation at least, as a movement, has tried to guarantee the rights of, incest rights, even though it goes along the same kind of principles as John Stuart Mill's harm principle, right? So there has been a kind of favoring of one kind of non-normative practice, in this case homosexuality, over other kinds of non-normative sexual practices, for example, incest, and so on. But this kind of, the reason for that is just simply because homosexuals in the 60s and 70s, or those groups who represented them, had more of a chance and had more success in being able to mobilize social support for their cause. If there had been a million father, brothers coming out together with placards, incest rights, we love each other, you know, seriously, I mean, would they be guaranteed the same rights? In many of the countries, which are liberal countries, this is illegal. This is illegal. Incest is illegal. But the question is, why is it illegal? It doesn't go against the harm principle. Say, deformed babies, but what if they're using contraception? What if it's two brothers? Brother and brother, there's no baby going to come out of that. Seriously. So there has been a double standard in the way even liberal principles have been manipulated in order to make cases. So if it's, oh, I've had lots of conversations. You can maybe see them on YouTube. What I find problematic is the most consistent answer, by the way, some of them are just straightforward to say, you're right. If we're going to afford rights for one non-normative sexual practice, like homosexuality, we should afford it for all non-normative sexual practices so long as no harm is done. That's a consistent answer. I would say, you know what? You make, you, at least you're consistent. But some homosexuals or other people who claim to represent their interests actually argued among, along naturalistic lines. They said, no, it's not natural for uh, a, a brother and a brother to have sex. So why is it not? Who defines natural now? Because you just told off that Christian guy. That it, you know, He told him off when he said, you're, what you're doing is not natural. So what gives you the right to determine what's natural or not natural? So a secondary explanation could be, well, we're born gay. And this is something David Hume referred to as the ought is problem. Just because you're born, let's just say for the sake of argument, I'm not going to go into the genetics, I'm not a geneticist. Let's say for the sake of argument, say you're born gay, no problem. But just because you are something, it doesn't mean you ought to be that thing. And there's no way that any philosopher has been able to solve this problem. David Hume himself in his book, Inquiry into Moral Ethics, he described the problem. He said, well, just because something is uh, the case, it doesn't mean it ought to be the case. What if someone is born with an incestuous gene? Does it mean that they should be incestuous? What if someone is born with something more pernicious than that? Or, in, you know, in our estimation, of course, 
You could argue morals are relative, frankly. I mean, who is to make the judgment? However, the point is, the all is distinction is always going to be a problem for someone who wants to say, we're born that way. So the problem is, when now we're asked, okay, in Islam, let's be honest. In Islam, why is homosexuality a sin? We say, wait, hold on. Why is that type, particular type of non-normative sexual practice permitted on your worldview? They say, because the, the harm principle. So, okay, well, the harm principle should apply to two brothers having sex and two sisters having, if you want to call it sex, you can call it sex, whatever it may be, right? Or even a brother and a sister, so long as some kind of contraception is used, and so on and so forth. But you're not using that. They are using that. Hats off to them. Well done. You're being morally consistent and you're being in accordance with the harm principle. If you're not using that and you're giving preferential treatment to one kind of uh, non-normative uh, non sexual practice of another, frankly, it doesn't even make sense. So this is the last thing I'm going to quickly touch upon now. And we've, talked, we've kind of touched upon the idea of some of the questions we're asked as, let's say, traditionalists or you know, conventional, orthodox, whatever you want to call it, Muslims, right? Why this? Why that? Well, the reason why they're asking that question, as we've just discovered, is because they have a dominant ethic, which frankly, for the most part, has not been consistently used in Western circles, is not predicated on anything which is objective. You can't put any of that stuff under a microscope. All of those morals, frankly, have not been verified. So they don't really have an, a, a reason to ask us any of those questions in the first place. Now when, you, when we talk about this thing, human rights, because now this is a guise, this is almost the Trump card. If you want to knock out, not Trump, Donald Trump. If you, want, if you want to knock out a Muslim, ask them about human rights. Ask them about freedom of expression and, and speech. What's the ruling on blasphemy laws? What's the ruling, and we'll talk about this in detail in the next section, on apostasy law. I'm going to bring this up as the case study. Riddah. What, what happens in an Islamic state? Yes, what happens? Is there, isn't that, is, is, is there a death penalty there? Is that, we'll come to it. It's a bit of a suspense. We'll talk about it in the next session. But isn't that against human rights? Let's say for the sake of argument, yes, it's against human rights. All of the things that you mentioned and other things, anything, it, well, yes, it's against human rights. But let's go back. What is human rights an outgrowth of? Human rights is an outgrowth of this shaky, destabilized, Liberalism, which frankly has not been substantiated in the first instance. So there's a problem there. Um, so in history, we're going to talk about, quickly, I mean, the, first of all, this word human rights, it was not referred to as human rights until quite recently. It was referred to usually as natural rights. So even when people like Jeremy Bentham was attacking it, he called it nonsense on stilts. Because what natural rights? How can you prove it? Jeremy Bentham, the one who talked about utilitarianism, the one who actually taught the teacher of John Stuart Mill, and the one who was, he inspired him in many ways. He called it nonsense on stilts, but we'll come to that. This is an interesting thing. There's a last slide for today, um, for this session, and then we'll come back and talk about the other things. The, this is an interesting thing. It's called Google Ngram. You can use it to see how much a word has been used in literature. And if you can see here, the word human rights itself only started to become popular around 1948, and obviously that's when it was written, the Convention of Human Rights. But before that, this term human rights wasn't even in the common vernacular of either the academics or the non-academics. So all of a sudden after the World War II, after World War II, this thing that you guys made up, frankly, called human rights, which we're gonna talk about, right? We are gonna talk about human rights. This thing you guys made up called human rights, which you insisted is universal, with any, without any proof, is now being used to colonialize, to colonize. It's, 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 it's being used to spread the, you know, liberalism by the sword. And that's the irony of it all. So the question is, to what extent are human rights compatible with traditionalist Islam? We're going to look at a case study, and we're going to be very straightforward today, guys. In the, after the break, we're going to look at some of the most controversial case studies you can think about, the most controversial questions. 
those which I was talking about which re reference the punitive law of Islam, those which reference, for example, the had, the hudud, the punishments in Islam. And we are going to do a thorough comparison, inshallah, between liberalism and traditionalist Islam. And what we're going to uncover and unearth, in my opinion, is going to be something which will put things in perspective. So I'll let you guys have the break now, because the time is up, and we'll see you after the break. Okay. All right, good. So um, this is going to be the last part of like the monologue, if you like, you know, and then after that, we're going to try and create more interactivity because it is important that we engage with one another. You might have lots of questions. I'm sure you do. Um, and so just to kind of carry on from where we left, pick up from where we left off. We talked about human rights as not being a term that was commonly employed um, throughout the centuries, frankly, right? It wasn't really a term which was goes all the way back to liberalism or all, all the way back to, for example, the ancient Greeks or something like that. Instead, it's a term which became very popular after 1948. That's not to say it didn't exist before 1948. It did exist, but it just become much more popular because of, well, because, as you know, the UN, which is an organization which is pretty much steered by the United States of America and other allies, um, took control of the UN and... Obviously, they had the convention, and after that convention was put forward, it became part of the media, became part of academia, and so on. But taking a step back now, the question is, because I mentioned and alluded to this in the beginning of this lecture, we talked about some of the mythologies that liberalism is predicated on. What did I mean when I say liberalism is predicated on mythology? Now, what I meant was this, the state of nature. The state of nature is a very important part of liberalism. And it's mentioned by many different uh, scholars and thinkers like John Locke, like Thomas Hobbes, like Rousseau and others. And for instance, Thomas Hobbes talks about this hypothetical state before human beings were contracted to the state. So let's take a contemporary example. We live in the West, for example. You guys live in Holland. I live in the UK. I'm born into you know, that state. You guys, may, many of you, uh, except for the illegal immigrants, I'm sure, <laughs> which is the majority, no? <laughs> We're born here, right? So you, so you come or you're born here or you decide to come over through ship or through whatever you guys did, right? <laughs> yes? You decide to come over here, and when you come over here, what are you obliged by? The law, the universal law. In other words, you have to obey the law of the land. You know, It's a straightforward thing, but the question is, who gave the government the power in the first place? Who gave government the power in the first place? So liberal theory would suggest that there was a state of nature. There was a primordial, if you like, state of nature, and then we contracted to a sovereign or a representative or a power. Now, when did this take place? When did this thing take place where there was man against man, where there, it was a brutish, poor and short thing? It never actually historically took place at all. This is a fake history. And it was made, this is mythology, this story, this fiction, frankly, this was made up. It wasn't a scientific investigation that was done. It wasn't historical records that were retrieved. It was simply a story, a bedtime story, a fairy tale. Seriously, I mean, this is what it's predicated on. Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and others, they, they talked about a time, a pre, maybe a prehistoric time or a pre-government time, where people were fighting each other, and so they needed to give up some of their rights in order to allow the sovereign master to come and protect them. And all of the subsequent generations of people would be subsequently contracted to that government, even if they didn't consent to it. Because we, living in a country, we didn't say we consent to there being a government. We consent to there being 
you know, a representative that's going to make law on our behalf. Sometimes you have voting, yes, but it's not. Some, we don't even consent to the system of government. So how do we justify from a liberal perspective that there is a government? It's this idea, which we're going to come on to, of social contract. But the primordial state is a story. It's a bedtime fiction. It's fake. It really is fake. Now, the story is, is different depending on which philosopher talks about it. So, for example, Kant, he says, All mankind, who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, liberty or possessions. So in the primordial state for, for Locke, he, he envisaged that there were some rights that ought to be protected in the first instance. Hobbes saw it more about man against man, but both made up the story that there was a time or there ought to have been a time. There's this hypothetical, metaphysical, mythological, fictitious thing that happened where we were all human beings were all like in the jungle if you like of life and we're all fighting each other and we needed some leader to come that we could cons consult with or contract with in order to stop the chaos and the anarchy that's the story so humans initially have rights of liberty Locke would argue and property to, uh, Hobbes would disagree with him but both have made up the story. It's a fake story. Now, the social contract was required now. And the social contract, we've already mentioned, is this contract that human beings took when they were in the state of fighting each other in the state of nature. They took this contract with the sovereign, some kind of leader, Maybe the, the sovereign had power, military power. Maybe they were able to pr grant protection. Wherever it may be, there was a contract. SubhanAllah, this is actually quite similar to Islamic theology. Because we also believe in a contract as well, you know that? You know, and it's in the Quran. But we believe our contract with, was with Allah. So we were contracted with Allah. They believe we were contracted with an imaginary fake figure. In fact, the book that Hobbes talked about is called The Leviathan. It's called The Leviathan. What is The Leviathan? It's a monster. It's a monster creature. It's a, it's a fake creature, like a, something sci-fi, like a sci-fi image. Tell me if this is not mythology. Why is it not mythology? Is it because the white man wrote it down? Be honest with yourselves. Seriously, is it because it's secular? It's f pure mythology. And there's nothing to justify it whatsoever. But as Muslims, we believe in a contract... Right with Allah, where Allah says in the Quran, with Akhad Allah Mithaq Bani Adam, Allah took the Mithaq, the contract with Adam, with the children of Adam, you know, and He took from their uh, He took from their back, you know, and He said, Alas to be Rabbikum. He said, Are we not your, am I not your Lord and your Master? Khalu Bala Shahidna. We said, Yes. So there, for, for us as Muslims, we was. We were contracted to Allah. For the liberal, we were contracted to some imaginary figure which didn't really exist, even according to them. If you ask any liberal today, do you believe in this, uh, this thing? No, we don't believe it. So they have a mythology as well. We don't have a mythology. We, we would say we can justify the existence of God from first principles, which is a different conversation for a different time. All right. So what are the entailments of social contract? And this is a key point here in the discussion. Because we talked about human rights. And some of the questions we're asked as Muslims relate to fundamental human rights. So for example, equality of men and women. This is, by the way, according to what strand of feminism? Second wave feminism, third wave feminism, you know, first wave feminism even. What do we mean by equality? According to whose feminism? Is it the Eurocentric understanding of feminism? Is it an African feminism? Is it a Middle Eastern fem That's a different discussion. But they say also that we have to have freedom of expression of whatever religious belief you want. To what extent though? Because obviously, society, even in this country and other countries, has decided that there are certain kinds of things which can't exist, which jeopardize security and so on. So the question is, when now we've come out of the state of nature, 
from a liberal perspective, we've come out of the state, state of nature and we're socially contracted to this representative, which in modern parlance would be referred to as government, right? When we're now rep we're, we're tied to such representative, the question is, what are the things this representative can do on our behalf? This is a key thing, and I want everyone to remember this, right? This is something which Immanuel Kant, which we said already, was one of the biggest philosophers in all of liberal history, but not only that, but one of the biggest philosophy of all of Western history. He basically says, I'm not going to read this whole thing, you can, you can kind of read it yourself. He basically says that if the supreme sovereign, this socially contracted thing, or body or rep government or whatever it is, they can, that has pretty much ultimate authority. Even if he decides to kill you, or kill some people, or jail some people, or hurt some people. There's a, there's a hadith in Sahih Muslim that says, which some people make fun of. That, you know, you've got to be obedient to the leader, even if he whips your back or takes your money. Obviously, there's such a big discussion on this. We're not having that discussion, but this is the same kind of thing in liberal theory. So in liberal theory, it's conceivable that there is a law which so limits, which so limits human freedoms so as to allow someone to be killed as a result. And John Locke says in one of his books, I think it's the two treatises of government, he says, if someone is commanded to stand in the face of a cannon, if a soldier is commanded to stand in the face of a cannon, yes, in other words, a blowing cannon, he should do it. And it's not illiberal for someone to do that, which is kind of like suicide bombing, by the way. Think about that. No, seriously, it's just, what is that? You know, tell me what that is. Standing in the uh, face of a cannon is destroying yourself. It's killing yourself. Suicide. So according to John Locke, and by the way, also according to John Rawls, who says that you can kill innocents. By the way, this is what he says. He says you can kill innocents in war, just war. You can, kill, you can target the innocent. Not collateral damage, no. You can target them. So you can not only be subject to a suicide-type scenario, according to John Locke, but all the way through to John Rawls, who said, you not only can be subject to such scenario, but you can subject others to such scenario as well. In other words, you can kill children. If it goes back to the social contract, and if it goes back to the mandated, legitimate, sovereign leader, who we have been socially contracted to in this mythological state of nature. Bearing that in mind, the question now is, what's the relevance of this and apostasy? Well, you know, the liberal would ask, what is this thing that you guys have in your old books of fiqh, of jurisprudence? And I said in the beginning of the lecture that when I describe, I'll be defining what Islamic traditionalism is. So I'll do it quickly now. Islamic traditionalism to me is a jurisprudential understanding of Islam, for example, through the four schools of thought in Sunni Islam. For example, right? So that's my understanding of Islamic traditionalism. So obviously, if you open a book of Islamic law, which is like a classical book, and you go to maybe the, you know, Kitab al Jinayat or something like that, you might see this Haddur Ridda, the punishment of apostasy. And you'll see that some of those scholars will say, the one who changes his religion, you know, they should be killed in an Islamic state. And you think, wait a minute, doesn't this strongly oppose human rights? And on the face of it, it does strongly oppose human rights. And this is not, on the face of it, prima facie, what we believe in anyway. This is a decontextualized understanding of Islamic law, and I'll explain that in a second. But what's interesting is this. So long as something is justified through a social contract on liberalism, Look what John Locke is saying. John Locke, who is the founding father of liberalism, says that there can be an apostasy law. Wait a minute. What does he say? He says, the first is those of who? Being initiated in the Mosaic rites. He's talking about the Jewish states or Jewish states. 
and made citizens of that commonwealth did afterwards apostatize, means become murtad, from the worship of the God of Israel. These were proceeded against as traitors and rebels, guilty of no less than high treason. Listen to this. No less than high treason. For the commonwealth of the Jews different in that from all others, was an absolute theocracy, nor was there or could there be any difference between that and the commonwealth of the church. Now, what does this mean? What's he trying to say? He's saying because the, 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 the state of the Jews is predicated on your contracting with God and your being Jewish in the first instance, that it's justifiable on liberalism. Listen to this carefully. It's justifiable on liberalism. From this social contract understanding, that if someone publicly says, I'm not a Jew anymore, for the state to say, come hold here, come here, we're going to execute you. Now, is that what the Quran says? The Quran doesn't make this kind of artic articulation, by the way. This is what John Locke says, who is the founding father of liberalism. So how conceivable is it, how conceivable is it on liberalism that these laws can be put in place? It is fully conceivable in principle. Now one could argue that was John Locke, that was 300 years ago, we're no longer looking at Locke. My argument is not about John Locke, he is looking at the conceivability through the principles of liberalism. I am saying because the principles of liberalism through social contract allow such possibilities, you cannot argue that liberalism is against a public apostasy law which would entail a death of a person. You cannot argue that. It's impossible to argue that. You could argue as a liberal, I'm not really you know, in tune with that and I think it ought not to be, but if a country decides, if a country decides, for example, that this country is not a secular country, not this country, obviously it is, but we're talking about a country like, you know, a Jewish state, I'm not talking about Israel, that's a different discussion. But if it decides, okay, this is not, we're not, our social contract is not a secular one, it's a theoc theocracy of some sorts, let's say, for the sake of argument, or it's something which is predicated on religious scriptures. If that's the case, the question is, how illiberal is it on social contractarianism to have such law, John Locke answers, in fact, this is not illiberal at all. And not only would John Locke say that, Immanuel Kant would say that, I've seen manuscripts of John Stuart Mill saying that, it's quite consistent. So, the question now is, what does Islam have to say about that? But before I go into that question about apostasy in Islam, there's an argument I want to make. And the main argument is articulated here, because this is part of my book. I've actually written a book here. It's coming out maybe the end of the year. Yes, yes, I've been doing the research. <laughs> and by the way, this is not something I just whipped up. This is, I've spoken to a lot of academics about this. All right, my main argument, liberalism or liberalization efforts are epistemologically fruitless if they are predicated on the assumption that such liberalization necessarily entails more freedom from government interventionism in cases which relate to administration of the death penalty for non-allegiance to a state. Now, that's a very long-winded statement, but you have to be careful with academics. What I'm saying is, there is something similar between, for example, that which is referred to as the Haddur Ridda, which is the, what is referred to as the punishment for apostasy and treason. And the, the common denominator is non-allegiance to a state. So, for example, if you look at the American Constitution, if my memory serves me correctly, I think Article 3 talks about the treason. It's, it's a clause on treason, a treason clause. And basically what it says is if you show non-allegiance, different states have different rules in America, it could be punishable and has been punishable by death. And by the way, what's interesting is, as a side note, in terms of actual case study examples, you'll find that America has conducted many extrajudicial killings outside of, obviously, 
the parameters of the judiciary. As you know, for example, many of you may have heard of Anwar al-Awlaqi. Yes? His son was killed. His name is Abdurrahman al-Awlaqi. And his daughter was also killed. They were kids, by the way. They were killed by a drone attack on them. Yes? They were killed by a drone attack on them. Why? Because the American government were afraid. Because, okay, their father is a radical. The child will also grow up to be a radical, right? So they, they literally sent little drones to kill the kids. Now, that wasn't, those kids didn't deserve to be killed. And no, moreover, they didn't even stand trial, if, if that was possible for a child to stand trial at the age of six years old or whatever it may have been anyway. So the question of extrajudicial killing is something completely different anyway. I'm talking about when the treason law itself has been implemented. And what's interesting, if you look at constitutional law in America, is that those defendants who are subject to such encroachments from the military establishment in America actually try and get the treason law to be enacted on them. In other words, they try and, a lot of them argue that we want to be tr tried in accordance with the treason law because they know they have more chance of being not killed, for example, in, in, in that case. But there have been those extrajudicial uh, killings. Now, that's something else. The point is this. It's conceivable principally. It is conceivable principally that a government, because it deems you as non-ally now, you're no longer a citizen, depriving you of your citizenship and so on, they can make a subsequent decision to kill you. And it has been done, but it's just been named something else. This is the point. Now, the truth is this. In Islam, you have to first ask, what is apostasy and what is treason? Right? Now, who gets to define treason? Now, someone might argue treason is this, and they'll go online and, you know, this pseudo-intellectual approach. Oh, treason means this. Listen, spare your white man definitions. Keep them to yourself. Seriously. Who wrote the dictionary? Who was it? Was it someone who we all agreed this is the authority? Yes, let him be the one? No, come on. Be, let's be f honest. Oxford Dictionary, Webster Dictionary. No, it wasn't something which we all, as humankind, decided, yes, this is... No, no. Vernacular definitions from the dictionary are fruitless to me. You can't use a secular definition, impose it on a religious framework, and exp ex try and explain things that way. Treason is defined differently, yes, because you have a secular framework versus a religious one. Why should you impose a, a secular framework on a religious one as much as why would you exp uh, impose a religious one on a secular one? They both have two different standards, right? However, the principle of non-allegiance is the same. So in other words, really and truly, what is the common denominator? When a state deems that you're no longer allied. Now, here's the point. Is it to do with what you believe? Now, I would put to you, submit to everyone here today, that it's not to do with what you believe. And the evidence is not, that there's no compulsion in religion. There is that. That's for the non-Muslims. By the way, that verse by Ijma' is for the non-Muslims. There's no compulsion in religion. Chapter 2, verse 256 means you can't force a non-Muslim to become Muslim. But what about Sorry, I've recited that quickly, but in Surah Al-Ahzab, where it says it's not for a man or a woman who's a Muslim or a mu'min, that when Allah and His Messenger decide something, that they have any choice in the matter. The point is this, even then, it's not to do with belief. And it's conceivable and possible for someone to lose faith in their religion. As a Muslim in an Islamic govern, government state, or whatever you want to call it, I'm not talking about those things which exist, but it's conceivable and they would have no repercussion whatsoever. It's not to do, and what's the evidence for that? Two pieces of evidence. One of them is the, the list of Hudayfa. Hudayfa ibn Yaman had a list of people who are munafiqun. What's a munafiq? A munafiq is someone who does not believe really in Islam. He does not believe in Islam. That's the true understanding of munafiq. Yes, he might walk around in society and not necessarily publicate that he's left Islam, but he does not disbelieve in, he doesn't believe in Islam. That list, even though Muslims were aware that those people were not Muslims, they didn't kill those individuals because there was no rupture of a social contract there. In other words, it's conceivable. Now, if someone in the West becomes non-Muslim, and they were Muslim, we're not going to say go and kill that individual. No way. This is an understanding of Islam which is Orientalist, decontextualized and completely wrong in my opinion. There's no way you can do that. 
Because there was no contract between you and that person that, okay, you are now allied to that state in that way. There's no state. In fact, the state here says you can do whatever you want and you can have whatever belief you want. So in fact, their contract is different to your contract. The Quran says, yeah, Those, O you who believe, fulfill the contract. So in other words, there is no contract there. There has to be a contract. You have to be under an Islamic state and you have to have agreed to the terms. If those conditions are not met, then we can't say there's any going to be any ramification. Now, another point is this, is that you have, and this is one of the final points I'm going to make, is that you have another example, and this is one of the biggest ahadith in Sahih Bukhari. It's in Kitab al-Shurut, the book of conditions. And then you have a discussion between Prophet Muhammad and the Quraysh. And, and the Quraysh were saying, if, listen to this carefully, if your people in, in your state become non-Muslim, bring them back to us. Do you agree to those terms? And he agreed to those terms. Say that one more time. He said, if people in your state become non-Muslim under this contract that we have now, bring those guys who have left Islam, apostated, back to us. He said, no problem. He agreed to those conditions. Meaning what really this, what this means is that it's totally conceivable, both on Islam and liberalism, for there to be some kind of social contract which would bind somebody to a state of being. Now, even if they decide to change their religion, it's conceivable on both liberalism and Islam that it's not a problem. And it's conceivable on both liberalism and Islam that it could have ramifications depending upon how it's perceived by the state. Now, next. The reason why the, the, the topic today was referred to as liberalism as religion, and this is a really interesting quote. I'm going to read it out. It says, Theories of modernization are not scientific hypotheses, but theodicies, narratives of providence and redemption presented in the jargon of social science. What we're saying is that liberalism, the reason why it's been able to have this perceived epistemological upper hand on the religious narrative, not just the Islamic one, is because it seems like you're speaking scientifically when you're talking about secular ideology. What we've been able to show today, ladies and gentlemen, is that that is not the case, and that the the first principles of liberalism are unfounded, unsubstantiated, unproven. We've also been able to show, ladies and gentlemen, that actually not only are the, th the first principles unproven, but a lot of them are based on mythology, fiction, stories, and so on. And so to favor that kind of a narrative over and above the Islamic one, or any other religious narrative for that matter, is frankly, academically, unfair in the first instance, epistemologically unjustified in the first instance, philosophically unjust, frankly. You can't do that and ask us questions. So before any questions are asked from a person who claims to be a liberal, who might be now thinking that they have found the ultimate truth, how can you prove liberalism as an objective moral standard, number one, from a scientific perspective or otherwise? or from a rational first principle perspective. Number two, why do you expect us to believe in your myth? Why? Even, even your philosophers that propounded that myth didn't believe in it fully themselves. They didn't conduct any scientific experiments. Number three, do you not realize that it's as conceivable on a contractarian understanding of liberalism to have as much punitive law as could conceivably be the case in an Islamic state with all of the punitive laws being implemented. So if that is the case, what do you have to offer us? What is modernization? Why should we be like you? What have you got for us? The answer is really you have nothing for us. Sorry to say, I need to be blunt. You have nothing to offer. Liberalism has nothing to offer Islam. That's the answer. Liberalism has nothing to offer Islam. It's, there's nothing there for us. Everything that's conceivable in liberalism can also be potentially conceivable in Islam and vice versa in terms of punitive laws and so on. So what's the issue? Now they'll say human rights. Human rights, and I'm going to say this once and everyone should remember it. They, human rights 
is a metaphysical construct which cannot be actualized in the real world. It's impossible to have an actualization of human rights with the existence of social contracts. You can never have ultimate freedom of anything. That's nonsense on stilts, as Jeremy Bentham said. It's impossible. Now, the, the answer is this, that liberals will say, we define the extent to which freedom of speech, expression, and so on, thought and religion should be exercised in a state in accordance with democracy or this or that or the other. But those things themselves are problematic because they, number one, could be in conflict with liberalism and number two could bring out results like Hitler, which, had, you know, retrospectively everyone looks back and says, how immoral was he? In sum, therefore, what I want to say is the question needs to be questioned. Whenever they ask you a question which is predicated on human rights, you should say, no, thank you. You have to first justify yourself. The last thing here I've got, sorry, is it okay for me to go over a little bit? Okay. Is this is, there is an Orientalism here. And by the way, Orientalism is not just a book that Edward Said wrote, which places the East as the subject of investigation, the abject, the other, but it's a kind of Orientalism which actually also exists in liberal discourse. So what many liberal Orientalists and progressive Muslims groups attempt to do is demonstrate the extent to which the hudud or punitive laws referred to in the traditionalist discourse are totally aberrational and therefore unacceptable in the context of human rights and liberalism in particular. From this adduction, Muslim minorities in the West who have no intention of bringing to life such abstract rulings are further abject to social imagination of large swathes of the majority of the populace. In other words, Really and truly, all of those punitive laws of Islam have nothing to do with the Muslim minority existence in the West. We have no intention whatsoever of implementing any of the punitive laws in the Western world. But those laws are used as an ammunition against a minority which produces an irony, frankly. The irony is, use those things to instill fear in the majority in order for you to juxtapose yourself or define yourself against the Muslim minority. And that is frankly a tyranny of the majority type logic which liberalism itself came to dismiss. Irony. It's an irony. Almost all liberal thinkers talked about tyranny of the majority. Now you have this guy, what's his name? Uh, Geertz. Cli what's his first name again? I don't care about his name, uh, you know, Wilder. Whatever his name. He's talking about a, a tax for women wearing a headscarf and this. This is against liberalism because it is, frankly, it doesn't understand that when you have a law in a liberal state, it has to be consistent to all people. He's not even liberal. His, his party is called the Freedom Party. You should take this ammunition, and it's not physical ammunition. If, you know, <laughs> no, take the it's intellectual bullets and shoot this guy and others. Physi no, not physically. <laughs> not physically. Intellectually. Where should I am? So... I'll end with that. <laughs> okay. Does that come along? And we'll open up for questions and answers. Thank you, Mr. Yes, now you can stay on the So, Q and A, um, guys, about the questions. Please, no fatawa. I love it. I know it. We love fatawa. Last year, two years ago, we were. I was at Medina Expo, and we had a two-hour lecture about community building. First question that comes in is is lobster haram. <laughs> guys, please keep it at the subject and. Challenge Mohammed Hijab a bit, okay? I want to see him sweat on his forehead. Okay. So who's got the first question? Assalamu alaikum, brother. Thanks for your uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question about your uh, debating approach. Um, you told us about the uh, harm principle and also, uh, so basically, um, more enjoyment, or what's the word exactly? More enjoyment, less harm. And more pleasure, that's the word, exactly. Uh, after that, you also uh, used another example um, uh, saying that if you don't harm, at least people saying that, if you don't harm the other uh, person, then it's okay, you can do whatever you want. And in your debate, you approach people, for example, by saying, um, what about uh, incestual relationships? But uh, what I was thinking is, suppose the other person you convince the other person, and the other person turns around and says, you know what, I'm actually for 
brother and brother or sister and sister relationships? Are we then going towards a society that's even more, uh, <laughs> you know, there's more fitna in the society, so we don't actually, at least I don't, or like we don't want that, I, I assume. So. Is is that the right approach to go around it? I or? can see I can see your concern. I can definitely yeah. see. <laughs> um, I think it's important to show people sometimes the inconsistency. If someone turns around and says, you know, I'm for that thing. I'm for brother and brother having intercourse with one another, or sister and sister, and so on. Then, to be honest with you, they're being uh, consistent with their moral and their ethic, right? But my issue is not with those individuals that are being consistent with their ethic. My issue is with those individuals that are not being consistent with their ethic. They would allow one kind of non-normative practice and not another. Now, is this what you, I think underlying this concern is, doesn't this bring people now closer to maybe legalizing incest in certain countries and so on? Well, to be honest with you, my friend, I'll be honest, you know, even if they didn't legalize it, it would still be happening. It would just be more socially acceptable or unacceptable. That's, that's the only thing. I think that incest is actually happening, it's just socially unacceptable. And from an Islamic perspective, there is a reason for that, which is the fitrah. The fitrah is the innate disposition which recognizes certain moral things as abhorrent, naturally, right? And we would use that same argument with anything which is non-normative and non-compliance with the Qur'an, by the way, not just incest. So if we can get them to kind of reflect using this kind of thought experiment or this you know, method of debate or whatever you want to call it, Sometimes it activates the fitra, and that's, that's the gharad, if you like, the objective of, of doing that. Not, not necessarily because I'm going to go outside of 10 Downing Street or the, what is it, the Hague here, I don't know where it is, or wherever you guys have um, parliament, and say, you know, brother and sister should really, I'm not, going to, I'm not a campaigner for that, just, you know, to be clear. But yeah, I see your concern, I think it is a bit of a double-edged sword, but we have to, we have to do it, you know? Okay. Sometimes the, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next question. Who wants to? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thank you very much, my brother, thank you. Uh, with your presentation. But one thing that's very important in, at this moment, uh, you talk about uh, John Locke and Immanuel uh, 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 Kant. They are metaphysics. A person and uh, he has done a lot of things to uh, recognize God in the community at Emmanuel Kant and about 12 years he researched about that that means after a very dark uh, period we have a, a renaissance period in European country my question is now the liberalism is a a fact that we have to compare with the Islam law. Uh, how you can compare it that Islam can be practiced in liberalism or liberalism can have effect in Islam. That is a sort of uh, reconciliation that we can uh, justify and also bring the people for a sort of uh, peace uh, community and it will be very useful for the future of the new generation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Emmanuel Kant, in, in Critique of Pure Reason, he was criticizing the cosmological argument. It's difficult to know where he stands religiously, by the way. I think he, there's a good case of him being an atheist, um, to be honest, because he criticizes the arguments for God's existence. But it doesn't mean just because he criticizes them that he doesn't believe in God. Um, so it's difficult. I think scholars have struggled with the, what is Emmanuel Kant's religious background. That's, a question I'll leave open. But in regards to your second question, I think you're absolutely right. I think there should be an accommodationist approach. Um, and that accommodationist approach is a recognition by both Muslim communities and majority, for example, non-Muslim communities, that actually where Muslims are minorities, yes, they, will ha they must be subject to the law of whatever land they're in. And that's, by the way, part and parcel of what they believe in. So, even, so you cannot impose a law which is Islamic on a liberal state, but what liberals must understand is that they cannot impose a law which is liberal, anti-Islamic in an Islamic state as well. And that is a fair approach, I believe. And if, if that is understood, then this colonial attitude of, oh, we've got the right metaphysic and you don't have the right metaphysic, that can start to be put aside. And we start realizing that actually, okay, we have our way and you have your way. 
But when there's this approach, which actually is linked very strongly with the colonial, um, you know, the colonial empire of the hegemonic West at the moment, and, pre and in the maybe last 200, 300, 400 years with slavery and all that stuff, it becomes more problematic because it becomes sanctimony, Western sanctimony. Oh, you should be like us, basically, as if God made the world in Western image. So that is, I think, where the problem is. Well, we have to challenge it, but there is a truth there. If we're living in Western countries, we have to abide by Western law so long as that law does not arbitrarily discriminate against Muslims like the kind of laws we're seeing, unfortunately, being passed in this country with the niqab ban, for example, or in France with you know, head covering being taken off, which clearly is, is targeted against one community over and above all other communities, which is against liberalism. It's not only just against Islam, but it's absolutely against liberalism because it destroys the um, unarbitrariness of law and it destroys the principle of you know, trying to look after a minority rather than tyranny of the majority. So we have to remind them of their own principles sometimes as well. Maybe a sister now? Come on, be feminist. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've right, been so. very critical tonight about n concepts like democracy, secularism, human rights, and uh, you just, in continuation with the previous question, uh, how can we see the rule of Islam, the Sharia, basically, let's name things as it is, how can be fit within uh, the, the laws that we have nowadays in, in Western countries or uh, in any country whatsoever, and that they apply secularism. And you said we should remind the white men how, how we as Muslims um, prefer to live, which, like according to which laws. But the question is, as I said, we've been very critical. The self-criticism is how we as Muslims should remind them and what should we do like, to be a positive and active part in this kind of discussion or procedure to, to reach that point. I think that you're right, you're absolutely right, we should be introspective. But introspection comes after uh, the insurance of protection. So black people in the United States couldn't start saying we're going to you know, attack our own community in the 1960s and be introspective unless they first established themselves as a community, were able to secure certain civil rights, and then we can have discussions about how to fix things within our own house. But if we're not being given, and this is the issue, if we're not being given equal treatment you know, through this kind of unarbitrary law, that's the starting point. We have to start with that first. Once that conversation is done, or during, and meanwhile, we can also talk about, like you said, how we should be, you're absolutely right, positively contributing through charity and through community work and through, you know, I'm not going to use the word integration, by the way, but through economic contribution to a state, which doesn't jeopardize any of our principles. So I think these are parallel conversations we can have at the same time, but we should make a focus uh, of the discussion, our own rights, otherwise they're going to tell us what our rights ought to be. I think that should be a focus. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, you started off with some uh, epistemology, mm -hmm. and um, so lately I was uh, reading some books of philosophy, some skeptic works, Mm -hmm. um, about knowing things. And mm -hmm. I read this skeptic paradox, and I don't know if you've heard of it, mm -hmm. uh, any about knowing whether we have hands. Mm. Uh, no, I haven't read this one. Robert Nozick, George E. Moore. Oh, Robert Nozick is a liberal himself. Yeah, hi. Yes. Okay, um, go ahead. <laughs> so the, the paradox goes as this. Um, go I know that I have hands. Yeah. I don't know that I'm not a brain in a vet. If I do not know uh, that I'm not a brain in a vet, I do not know if I, that I have hands. Okay. Uh, so I, I read an um, uh, internalistic uh, approach to, uh, on this, an uh, internalist answer, externalist answer, but they don't, could not uh, really convince me. So I would uh, like to ask you, how would you answer this paradox? I don't know. Paradoxes are unanswerable by nature. You know? I mean, to be honest with you, I can give you, the, I can give you 20 paradoxes. It's, the whole point of a paradox is that many of them are unanswerable, right? But are they, are they physically relevant to the real world? So a lot of, a lot, for example, let me give you another paradox, which a lot of you might have heard, right? That, and this relates to theology. So can God create a rock so heavy that he himself can't lift, yeah? And after thinking about this for a long time, here's my answer, right? The existence of such a rock would disprove God's existence. Because God, by his definition, is 
You know, so it's an omnipotent, it's, it's all powerful. So it's t- certain things that God does, that if he does, he stops being God. Like if he becomes a man or starts having limitations or something like that, or weaknesses. So the, in other words, these paradoxes, and this is something which hopefully will help you with every single paradox out there, some of them are problematic in semantics. In other words, the way you're phrasing the question has no material relevance in the real world. It do, it's not possible. It's like saying, can God create a square and then change it? Can God create a squared circle, for example, right? Can, no, but but that's such a thing, squared circle concept, is not an applicable one to the real world. And most paradoxes are like that. The paradox itself is not applicable in a cosmological reality. So it's only, um, it's only something which can be said by syntax, but cannot be shown by physical necessity. So all of the paradoxes of the world, almost all of them, can be solved like that, even the mathematical ones. But in terms of the actual physical ones, and uh, you know, there's, there's a book on the guy called Jim, Jimmy... Uh, Khalili, I think he's there. he wrote a book on paradoxes, and you know, Jimmy Khalili, he wrote a book on, on like, a, I don't know, a hundred paradoxes in there, and the, the answer is the same. Usually the paradox can be solved by saying that these things are not implementable in the real world, they're not physically tangible there, you can't, you can't engage with them really. No more paradoxes, everybody's confused. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote down my question to uh, briefly uh, ask it. Um, you stated uh, liberalism has nothing to offer Islam. Mm. And um, as a believer, I am convinced about the moral uh, superiority of Islam. Mm. But I can imagine that um, liberal- liberals might think, uh, where are the examples of a sound, peaceful, economically and socially healthy community in Islam? Um, so the lack of good practices. Uh, whereas there are plenty of them in Western uh, liberal countries. How, how would you reply to this question? The Quran says, You know, there's, a, there's an interesting book called The Rise and Fall of Great Empires. The Quran says that these are the days which we alternate between the people. In the 1,400 years of Islam's civilized, I'm not going to say civilizational existence, but certainly in terms of its timeline, you'll find that there were times where it was, if not the superpower, one of the superpowers of the world. You know, so if you look at, for example, the Abbasid Empire, that is an example. It's a historical example of a thriving, you know, civilization which incorporated different parts of the world and where people, <laughs> you know, dealt with intellection, if you like, civilizationally in the libraries of Baghdad. If you look at, for instance, the, uh, the example of Spain, you know, that's a very big example. You had so many, a plethora of scholars coming out there, so, so much so that some people even said that that movement started the Renaissance in the West. Don't forget the West, even despite the fact that liberalism existed within it for many years, was not in fact in that peaceful state of existence that you think it was in. I mean, the European Dark Ages, which many historians say started from about 410, when for historical purposes they say the Anglo-Saxons came into Britain, up until about you know, maybe about 1400s or something, you know, that was the European Dark Age, a thousand years of, you know, a lack of, you know, substantive, um, you know, uh, contribution given from the West. So this narrative is problematic. Islam has probably more examples than any other civilization, if you look in a historical timeline, of uh, multiculturalism, number one, because frankly, liberalism coexisted with slavery. It coexisted with racism. It coexisted with colonialism. It, and in fact, it was spread by colonialism. Uh, Napoleon, he spread liberalism by the sword. He was referred to as a liberal dictator. You know, don't forget he was a liberal after the, you know, the French Revolution. So this narrative is really problematic. It really, really is problematic. The, you know, racism was justified up until the late 19th century in America, where you literally had slaves which were black, and the reason for them being black slaves was, 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 was actually given reason to through liberal frameworks, the social contracts and all those things. So this thing here that we're talking about is not as black and white as many people think. That's why the Quran gives us a formula. It says, look at those people that came, that came before you. You know, they were stronger than you in strength. 
and there's many different ending of that verses in the part of the Quran. So in other words, look at the, the civilizations that have risen and fell, yeah? And realize that actually this is less to do with ideology and more to do with all other things, military success, geopolitical circumstances, you know, even natural resources. Why did the industrial revolution happen in 1760 in, in, in England and not in India? Is it because, you know, the English people were more clever and they knew how to deal with... No, it's because there was a concentration of coal in Britain, which they could use to power, you know, steam trains and so on. So a lot of it, these things are, you can't correlate, it's a false thing, it's a, it's a fallacy to think, I'm not saying you're doing the fallacy by the way, I'm just saying it's, it's a fallacy to think that correlation equals causation. There are a plethora of different contributing factors. If we look at that in, in totality, we realize that the situation is way more nuanced than we think. Maybe a question on that side, yes, thank you. Bismillah. Um, Salaamu Alaikum Muhammad um, Ijab. My question maybe inshallah fits you very well because the question was also a, bit, a little bit of political yes. issue. Um, today I came from Austria, Vienna, and my question is because of this area, yeah. um, many people are very feared. It's, it's, a, it's a Dawa question actually. Okay. Many pe people are very feared about something like a great replacement, mm -hmm. which happens because of increasing of Muslim population in Central Europe probably. Mm. And my question is, many people fear about this mm. great replacement and this affects Muslims too worldwide, you know. My question is how to handle these um, mm. wrong narratives because it's very, um, it touches many people, the people in Europe, and they also fear Islam will less liberate them, so to say. So how, what is your recommendation on that topic? I think topic. you guys are doing a great job, by the way, in Austria, because he's got an organization, you know, it's called Iman, isn't it? That's great. Yes, it's a, it's a great organization. That's what we should be doing. We should be raising our voices and making the arguments. And if we don't do it, that it's going to be, the argument is going to be put on us. And I think what you guys are doing in Austria, knowing the social context, because me being from Britain, I'm, there's only so much I can offer everyone else. You know, people in specific contexts you know, must do their own homework, look at the social and legal context and deal with the issues at hand. You know, so the kind of work you're doing is exactly what needs to be done. And sometimes it's just a matter of, like the sister was talking about, kind of self-reflection and things like that and being contributive to society, literally mixing with people. Because Pew Research has shown us that the most racist or Islamophobic societies are the ones which have the least interaction with Muslims. You know, so if we go, and this country is a little bit of an odd case, because you've got 20 million people, but you've somehow got this guy and this far-right thing with so many seats in parliament, it's quite an odd situation in Western Europe to have that many you know, seats. So what I would say is, we need to go out to the areas where there is not as many Muslims. We need to, these are the areas we need to go into, we need to tap those areas, we need to show these people, as sad as it sounds, that we're actually human beings. Do you know what I mean? As sad as it sounds, because they don't believe that, you know, and, and really they don't, because if you look at what they've done and how dehumanization works, it starts off with this otherizing and it ends out, it finishes off, it plays out until someone is killed. And, you know, one of my good friends, his name is Salah, Sh uh, Salah Sharif, who I did a podcast with as well, he's doing his PhD on, on dehumanization and what he was talking to me about was how drones in particular are being used because drones, if you look at I mean, how they're it's little, you know, remote control, almost game-like, you know, things where you can go and kill someone. When someone is far away from someone, this is his conclusion, if you like, if, so, if the further away you are of someone, the easier it is to conceive of killing them for your gain. It's not, they're not human. It's, it's difficult. If you see a human right in front of you, the closer we become to them, right, the easier it is for them to realize that we're human beings. And unfortunately, what is happening is there is a steady process of dehumanization, which we need to close the gap of by actually being active members, like the sister was saying, in society, not just concentrating in one area. There needs to be groups of people that literally reach out to those communities where demographics are homogenous, if you like, where there's lots of white people and no one else. That's the most, these are the most dangerous areas, just to let you know. Because these are the areas where people are most likely to have the worst opinion of you, not just of you, of all other, you know, based on research and statistics on all other, you know, uh, racial groups. Now, that's a generalization, but for the most part, that's what the research directs us to. We need to go into those areas, tap them, talk to people, show them we're human, and keep doing the kind of stuff you're doing, man.
I got a hand over here. Yes. Did you come all the way from Vienna for this event? <laughs> we'll come back to Vienna. We'll, we'll go to you as well. At least I'll try and do that. Yeah, I totally agree that uh, dialogue is needed. But I have a question uh, for you. I'm not talking about liberalism. I, I don't know either. If I'm a Christian, I'm uh, but a liberalist. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm uh, uh, I'm in favor of uh, human rights, and I also have a Muslim friend who yeah. who who, uh, um, who wrote an article about yes. that human rights and uh, uh, Islam yes. are uh, really compatible. Yes, yes. Don't you think that for a dialogue between Muslims and non-Muslim in this country, yeah. uh, human the the uh, the statement of human rights yeah. is a good basis. Yeah, I agree. The, the and and, and I, I agree that they are both myths in, in the yes. way you... Huh? That's not... No, no, I, I totally yeah. agree with your sentiment. And I think yeah. you've asked a very good question and a mm -hmm. very pertinent one to the discourse. And I thank you for your contribution. Definitely mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue, of course, is of one of definitions, right? Mm -hmm. So who gets to define exactly what human rights are, how they should be implemented, and who should implement them? Because going back to Immanuel Kant, he believed in something called... This philosopher, and this is enacted, by the way, in the UN, it's called cosmopolitanism. That's a big word. What does it mean? It means that there are these universal laws which have to be implemented. Because if you have, imagine if you have a world state, right? You need to have a world police, and you need to have a world military, and you need to have a world, you know, judiciary, if you like. And I know this is going to sound conspiratorial, but the United States of America is trying to do that, basically. It's trying to create as many allies with it as possible, and it's trying to be the world police, the world military, and so on. So it's not just about human rights. This is an interesting guise, right, for the fact that America wants to encroach on as many countries' sovereignty as possible. And they do throw through the medium of human rights. So we need to look at definitions carefully, hierarchies carefully, because as Muslims and Christians, as Christians and Muslims, we believe in God's right as the most supreme right of all. Now, that's not indicated at all in any of the human rights. And why ought it not to be indicated? Because of the secularism or the secularistic uh, uh, presupposition. But we don't believe in that. We're not secularists in that sense. So from that perspective, I think I agree. Me and you are both not secularists because you identify yourself as a Christian. So we would want to see some of our, you know, deities' rights represented in this, right? What about human? What about um, mothers' rights? You know, 30 of the articles that were written in 1948 in that convention, only the word mother, I think, comes once. In Islam, we have a system where mothers come first. You know, it's not mentioned in human rights. So we would say, look, we have our own conception of human rights, where God comes first, you know, spousal, spousal rights, mother's rights, husband's rights. We have our own conception, and it, and it ranges from a societal description all the way to a domestic one, all the way through to a familial one, all the way up to a metaphysical one. That's our conception. And there's going to be a great deal of overlap. And that's where we can have the discussion. But we can't start by saying, yes, we must agree that these are the objective human rights that we all must universally accept, because that conversation is unfair, I believe. Oh, a lot of questions, mashallah. Um, let's sit there now, and then we'll come to you, inshallah. Um. In most of the conversations, or as you said, um, that we get very apologetic. Um, so do you have like uh, more suggestions next to what you said to turn the conversation around? Yeah, so a lot of the lecture was trying to give you material for that, right? So the most, one of the most powerful things in the world that you can do is ask a question, okay? Asking a question unlocks everything, right? And usually the one who's asking the question has the power, right? That's not always the case, but if you just think about three questions to ask them about whatever presupposition they're coming from. So, for example, as a feminist, right? Second wave feminist. And says, how comes in Islam, you know, no one brought it out, so I'm bringing it out myself, right? Because it usually is the issue of great controversy. Someone says, okay, how is it the case that man, for example, has different inheritance laws to women in the Quran? For example, it shouldn't it be equal? The presupposition is that different things should be treated equally, by the way. Where there's anatomical and biological and psychological difference, despite those differences, which, by the way, second-wave feminists acknowledge, 
If I said women is more emotional than men, does that, do I sound misogynistic? Be honest. A little bit, yeah? If I say a man is stronger, he can control himself better. You know, a woman, she gets emotional, she can cry, she'll, she'll get palpitations, she's completely... Say, hold on, man, you're being misogynistic. Say, these are not my words, these are the words of Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> who is who? The writer of The Second Sex, page 45. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, wait a minute, so, so you're saying all those things, but, but despite the fact that you, she, she makes the case, despite those differences, there should be what? There should be equality. But we say, well, hold on, can you, okay, I'm willing to go along, please. I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. But before we continue, I think it's fair that you have to first justify that first premise. Where there is difference, we should still be equal. Can you elaborate? Can you elaborate on that? Can you prove that? I mean, no problem, I'll, I'm, I'm willing to take that on board. But what you have to prove, because you made the claim. I mean, the burden of proof is on the one who made the claim. They've made the claim here, so I'm, I'm willing to listen to the argument. You just have to show me where the principle of equality despite difference should, ought to, prevail over difference prescription where there is difference, for example, right? So the point I'm making is, one of the best tactics is to, to question presuppositions. And by the way, on that, on that thing of um, inheritance, we have a good researcher with us called Sheikh Mahal Uthman. He's actually found that he, he did an exhaustive what we call istiqra, looking at all the cases, and he found that there are 20 major cases of inheritance, 16 of which, by the way, according to his research, women get more than men. Did you know that? It's really interesting where there's tw 20 different possible cases of uh, inheritance, 16 of those cases, despite the fact that, yeah, the boy gets We know those verses, don't worry, right? But despite that, women get actually more in 16 out of 20 cases. So if there is an inequality here, it probably goes in the way of the woman. So let's uh, go to the next question, inshallah. But you get, get what I'm saying, yeah? There's yeah. already a mic over there. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your excellent presentation. It was thank a great uh, insight. You're going to uh, destroy this guy, man. <laughs> As you were talking, this guy is trying to... Is it, is it Gitz Wilders here? He's trying to kill us here or something. He found out where we are. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank is you very much. Is that his name, yeah? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It was a crash course in, in liberalism. I also, uh, I also liked your accent very much. It was like listening to Queen Elizabeth. I like you guys' accent beard. as well. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, so basically, the, 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 the key element of your speech uh, yeah. of questioning the question is yeah. a very interesting one. Yeah. And on a micro level, on an individual level, it yeah. is a very effective way to um, provide the your colleague or your friend or whatsoever with another insight or another perspective to create more understanding between one another. Mm -hmm. The question I would like to ask is that if you take that questioning the question, that concept, that notion to another level, to a more strategic level, okay. because I think the, underline, the underlining uh, mm. idea of questioning the question is to influence the narrative to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you influence a narrative, there is a way that you have the upper hand and there is a way that you can teach the other one something. So if you would take that notion to another level, to a more strategic level, so not on, an, not on an individual level, but more, let's say, more on a political level or a societal level, how would you advise us, or what is, it, what is your view on that? How, would, how do you think that we could do that in the most effective way possible? I think formulating questions and getting wider society to think about them is one of the best techniques you can do. Okay, really. And you don't have to answer everything. I think your way of thinking is excellent, by the way, right? You're thinking about how do we implement these strategies on a wider political level and to ch change the narrative. That's exactly what we should be doing, right? But we can't, I mean, Thomas Hobbes, since we've mentioned him today, he says, man is but, covenants are but words if they're not backed by swords. Now, I'm not telling you to go get some swords. But what he's trying to say is that you're only, your word is only as worth as much as your strength. So if you speak as loud as you can, but you're in a forest or in, a, in a, you know, an empty room, no one's going to hear you, right? So you need to put yourself strategically in the right places. Formulate the right arguments, put yourself in the right places, and keep, keep rocking the boat, basically. 
Because if you don't rock the boat, we're not going to be able to, once again, this idea, we're not going to be able to preserve our children's futures. We know now Western Europe is becoming way more right-wing. It's unbelievable how it's working. And a lot of that is our fault because we're not rocking the boat enough, we're not shouting as loud, to be fair, as homosexuals shouted in 1960. Or as uh, black people did, in, 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 and, and that's how they got their rights, right? So what we're saying is, we need to rock the boat more and we need to get more involved and it's going to be for the future of our children. The way you're thinking is right. Just keep thinking the way you're thinking, right? Put yourself in the right places and ask the right questions. But it must be in the right places though. Yep. Yes, uh, right here, by the way. Hello. There I am. Um, I have a pro-life question. Um, liberals tend to be very pro-choice. And you see more and more advocate for um, the liberal position being uh, abortion on demand, without apology, with no exception, and preferably until birth. Mm -hmm. So um, as a Christian, that obviously is a thorn in my eye. So mm. uh, because I'm ruggedly pro-life, I'm hardcore pro-life. Yes. Um, and as a Christian, I see many Christian um, organizations yes. uh, that uh, advocate for the pro-life position in the public domain. But I barely, if any, see any uh, Islamic uh, mm. pro-life organizations. So my question is two-pronged. Yes. Um, number one is, do you know of any uh, Islamic organizations that argue for the pro-life position in, in, in the public domain? Mm. And two, what is your take on the Islamic position of the pro-life uh, argument? I think, very good question, it's an excellent question in fact, you know, but within Christianity there is a spectrum as well. So Catholics are usually way more rigid than Protestants. And I think the Sunni position, and usually the Shiite position as well, is more in line with the Protestant reasoning than it is with the Catholic one. So we don't believe that conception happens when, obviously, uh, uh, sorry, that life happens at conception. We believe that there is either 40 or 120 days where in which, you know, the um, hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, uh, you know, in أَحَدَكُمْ لِيَكُونَ فِي بَطْنِ أُمِّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ يَوْمًا نُطْفَ ثُمَّ يَكُونَ عَلَقَةً بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ ثُمَّ يَكُونَ that we, one of you is going to be 40 days in your... Sorry, I'm just uh, getting the hadith out. The hadith is that if one of you is going to be in your mother's room for 40 days, and then they'll become alaqa and mutwa. So in other words, scholars say that the, uh, the, the, the soul, the ensoulment period is either from 40 to 120 days. I follow the Hanbalite school of thought, which says 40 days. So anything before 40 days is uh, possible to have an abortion, anything after 40 days, I don't accept that, unless there is some kind of extenuating circumstance, and there are some extenuating circumstances, there are some scholars in Islam which go further than that, and so on. Now, that's point one. So in terms of that, so we don't, we're not as rigid as the Catholic position, we're more in line with the Protestant position. Point two, to be honest with you, if we see Christians doing a good job, we leave them to it, okay, usually. <laughs> All right, so some things that Christians are arguing for and doing that we can't do. Okay, you do, go, you do that. Some Christians, to be fair, in South America and other parts of America, to be honest, are putting us all kind of, you know, making us embarrassed, just like some Muslims make us embarrassed as well because they're blowing up abortion clinics and those things as well. well that's problematic for us. I'm sure it's problematic for you. So I think there is, there is scope for, this, uh, for agreement. There can be collaboration here. There are points of uh, interest, but for us, the reason why we're not talking about abortion as much, which is a big problem, right? Especially when it's done after, let's say in these, some countries, some states, apparently after six months, some ridiculous things like that, which we would see as murder, as, as, as killing someone, right? Uh, and you'd have to pay blood money and all those things in Islamic law. And the, the reason why we're not involved in that as much is because we're too busy a lot of the time looking at how much of our children that you know, are already born are being killed in foreign policy, right? So that's the issue. I think we're, we're trying to prioritize minority groups, what to talk about first, second, and third. You're right to have a concern, and you're right to think that we should be more involved. But usually when the Christians once again do a good job of something, we usually lead them to it. Jews would probably have more of an influence on the... Pardon? Okay, oh, well, I, you know, maybe we could help you in some way, shape, or form. But we'd have to be in, in, in compliance with our own principles. And I agree with your sentiments to a great extent. 
Thank you. Zubir, the other microphone, please, yes. in front. I want to, I want to ask, uh, uh, when looking at uh, liberal laws, uh, for example, in America, what holds more weight when, uh, for example, children must pledge allegiance to the flag in the morning at uh, school or the freedom not to, achieve, not to do that? Or would that be uh, treason? So in, according to their laws, what holds more weight or more... Uh, yeah. I don't think they would deem it treason if the kid decides not to do it, by the way. Um, but there are some things, I mean, every state, once again, there are states which have certain requirements for treason to take place. And so we have to be very specific as to how we're making the argument. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things which shows that there's a nationalistic underpinning. You're right, the, the whole allegiance to the flag thing. I mean, desecrating a flag in many countries, in liberal countries, is seen as a criminal offense. And that shows you the extent to which, for some reason, Republican liberal states decide where and where, you know, how, where and how they can determine freedom of expression. It shows a contradiction in their principles. So it's good to outline that from that perspective, that this is a contradiction in your principles because it's not in line with the freedom of expression you promised in the first instance. That's how I would kind of argue it. The mic is in the middle somewhere, yeah. Hello? So, uh, Aikum, thank you for your speech. I have a question. Um, yes. What is the main cause with regard to uh, people from the West or liberals? Um, we try to force down their standard of norms and values, and what can we as Muslims do about this? The reason why they do it is the reason why anyone does believes that their morals are true. It's, it's usually because they've been socialized into believing in that. Like, for example, if we were all born in ancient Greece, and we, were, you know, we saw Athena as one of the Greek gods, and we knew that this god was responsible for this and this. It would be ingrained in our culture so much so that we might just feel it almost natural, if you like. You know? And so they've been brought up into this, and they can't strip themselves away from this paradigm. This box is really difficult for them to take themselves out of. And so it's, it, you, you do have to engage with people in order to take them outside of that box so they can see that actually this is a rigid box with its own you know, problems and so on, and it has a certain amount of dogma attached to it as well. So I think that it's difficult for anybody in any society to see above and beyond their worldview, but with liberalism the problem is that that's a problem because liberalism itself talks about it doesn't have any fixed positions on certain moralities. And then to also, and the issue is on foreign policy that if you take this liberalism, which is meant to be espousing the self-expression of someone and spread it, you know, that's the real problem. This neoconservative understanding of liberalism is the most problematic of all. Because how can you force someone to, I mean, you're forcing someone to be free. It's a, that's a paradox. I mean, you were talking about paradox. <laughs> that's, that's the real paradox. So I think generally it's difficult for people to think like that because they're born and raised, oh, you know, and it allows them to live a very kind of heedless lifestyle, frankly. You know, I don't know how it is in the Netherlands, but, you know, we have a pub culture in our country, in the UK. I'm sure that you have it as well, yeah? It's tomorrow King's Day or something, yeah? Yeah, great party. So make sure you stay home. Uh, so... <laughs> So it allows them to live that life without any regrets, but really they have the most regrets because if you look at suicide rates and if you look at depression rates, this lifestyle isn't doing it for them on a psychological level. Last question in the front, so make it a good one. You said uh, liberalism, liberalism has nothing to offer to Islam because it, it's not based on objective morality, yes. which you've demonstrated very well tonight. But what would you reply to a liberal who in turn questions the objective morality of Islam? And isn't the real question here tonight, uh, the objective morality of Islam versus the subjectiveness of uh, liberalism. Mm -hmm. So a liberal would say, well, what makes Islamic ob uh, morality objective? The thing is, it's not just Islamic um, morality, but it's the idea of theism itself, right? Where you have a transcendent entity, which is all-knowing, all-wise, and all-powerful, which can endow these agents agencies with free will and the ability to make it or the ability to make a decision and also you know morality if morality does not come from such a transcendent being such that if you wipe off all of the humans on the earth that the morals would stay the same right then it's difficult to make a case for objective morality therefore I would say that if you want to argue on theism you'd have to prove theism on first principles 
So maybe an argument for the existence of God, and then attach to that something about the omnipotence and the all-knowing nature of God. Once you realize such an agency exists, then it makes sense that such an agency can, would, uh, and has endowed human beings with such morality. And from there you can have a discussion. But the only, to be honest with you, in the history of philosophy, only a few philosophers have actually dared to say, you know, we have a mechanism. Not that there are objective moral morals, there are many people who say that, but we have a mechanism for objective morality. One of them was Immanuel Kant. He had this belief of the uh, categorical imperative. I'm not going to go into it, but everyone has, not everyone, but it's been criticized, this belief. The mechanism itself is really problematic, but the idea is you can't, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to have a mechanism like that. So, so philosophers have not really bothered, apart from a, far, a few of them in number, and so, if you argue on theism, then obviously you can say objective morality comes from the all-knowing God. Simple as that. If you don't argue on theism, it becomes very difficult. Immanuel Kant found it very difficult, and he's been criticized with his mechanism of the categorical imperative, but not many people believe in this objective morality can be proven me mechanistically, if you like. 